I'm an, an architect by training, even though I collaborate a lot with lighting designers and other designers. And I think that my talk today will talk briefly about the definition or the process that we work and how we collaborate with our uh, uh, partners as well as show some of the projects. Uh, my office is uh, called WHY Architecture, or why, I mean, that's part of my name too, but at the same time, we like it uh, that the process of making architecture is always about asking. Asking why, and as well asking how. I actually have two offices. I have why, which is the office that do the architectural design, and how, which we call our kitchen. Because you have to know why you want to do it, and you want to know how you can make it happen. So at the how laboratory of kitchen, we do a lot of experimentation and other things that I can show later. And this is the office. Uh, we are based in Los Angeles um, um, in, in the US, and we have around 22, 23 people right now. And um, before I start uh, talking about my work, I would like to share the thoughts I have about architecture in general. Uh, I feel that we're in a, a process of big change uh, from many things. And so we see where is architecture today? Uh, first of all, you know, in around 55, Ms. Van Der Rohe, as you know, mentioned less is more as a mantra for uh, minimalism or, or uh, the, the aspect of modern architecture as you see. And around the postmodern period, then Bob Venturi said less is more because we want something that has more meanings. And then later, Philip Johnson, just before, said I'm a whore because he could really uh, took all of the possibilities and styles and put it into uh, you know, uh, his expression of architecture. And in a way, we left uh, in, a, in a period when there's no ideology. You know, there are many, many people doing many wonderful things, but it's really uh, representing a period that uh, uh, rather difficult to, to, to define what is the style. Uh, but at the same time, I think architects are losing touch with uh, the society or things in general. And why is that? I think a lot of problem is because we start to think about who are we designing with. We become, I mean, especially you know, in many uh, places that I've worked, uh, pretty obsessed with our own self-expression. It's about our language. It's about our uh, philosophy that we like to be known within the world. At the same time, uh, like what Kabuzia said, life, life is always right. In the sense that if you do the right thing, I think there's always a, 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 a system there. So by doing that, I really feel that architecture is really looking back towards life in many ways. As you can see, architecture these days, they all either relate to biology, relate to life, relate to environment, many things. And all of these, I think, are strives or struggles to get architecture back to where life used to be and they're trying to create a linkage between them. At the same time, you know, in my work, I do a lot of work that relate to art and also the environment. As you see, the art and earth is all related. And it, we're all in there together. And you know, for many of us that travel and work in many places, it's very easy to know that it only takes one connection from one place to the other. And I think that, I mean, starting from my own um, history or my own uh, process, um, I started in Asia. I was born in, in Thailand, which is right in the middle of Asia. Uh, when you're a small country between China and India, you learn to behave. You learn to know who's doing what and how you should respond to the powers or the conferences around you. At the same time, I grew up and went to school and worked for a long time in Japan. Japan is also another small person, but he is a small person at the extreme. He doesn't have to relate to any neighbors. He's an island. And so between Thailand and Japan, you see how two small, I mean Japan is not small, but in size, uh, uh, really learn to deal with their own identities. And that really come up a lot in food. Uh, the, I mean, we all love food, I know that, so I think I'm not, I'm not going to go into the detail, but there's a lot of similarities between architecture and food, in the sense that both are very crucial to life. 
I mean, shelter and food. At the same time, the relationship or the meaning can only come out when people actually experience it. You know, this, uh, it's, it's silly to try to understand food through a magazine. It should be the same thing in architecture, that you can only experience and understand the goodness of architecture through the experience of a person in himself. And they're trying to draw it back, because I think that's where life comes in, is that it's not about looking through a media. It's about experiencing it. And I think in a way that uh, talking about uh, the combination of the food, uh, if I compare the Thai food to Japanese food, Thai food is always about mixture. It's about blending, because when you're a small person between all these wonderful civilizations, you need to learn how to do that. And I'm completely learning the first hand that in Turkey it's even much more because of the layers and all the influence that happened. And over time, you, you learn to be so good at mixing things because that's just the way it is. You know, you, you're trying to create a balance. Japan is the opposite. Japan is always about refining, about abstraction. It's about taking one thing in and keep refining it and refining it and refining it until it becomes the abstract version of what it is. And I think that's how the two uh, pretty small countries in Asia learn to cope with their own identity. And when you look at the food, the food represents that. Thai food is always about mixing. It's always so many flavors all at once. Japan, Japanese food is about always distilling, refining. It's only one major test at the same time. And a very good sense of clarity. And the unity actually come uh, through the strength by it being uh, singular. Whereas Thai food is opposite. Thai food is always about mixing many flavors at the same time. And the strengths of Thai food actually come through the plural uh, flavors and taste you get into it. Like this. But at the same time, you know, in the age that we deal with today, I think that the model of Japanese sushi is really getting difficult to comprehend because you're dealing with influence and sources around you. You're dealing with a society that everyone has to say. It's very difficult to try to be very singular and very direct about one thing. It's about trying to combine all the influence together, architects, engineers, designers, and all, and trying to really bring out the best balance. And I think that our design professionals were not trained to do that. You know, we are trained to express ourselves as an artist using the craft of our uh, teaching. But the idea of trying to bring everything together, I think uh, is something that is quite crucial. And I learned that by looking at young people in my office, uh, trying to learn to, to deal with the work day to day. But at the same time, I also would like to uh, talk about the, the fact that food and architecture are all about limitations. It's about what we can get and we can cook out of it. There's no point dreaming about ingredients because ingredients are there only when you get it and you have, you have limited time and resources to put it together and to serve it to the best of your ability. And I think that's another issue that more and more in this time, people always, always talk about ideals, or if I have all the money and time, this is what I will do, which in, in real life, I mean, hardly happen. But at the same time, what I'm very interested in and would like to talk more about today is that how do we turn limitations and even crisis into something that even benefit at all? Because that's, in, in a way, the fundamental of what architecture is. You know, when I was young, I was very obsessed with identity, you know, coming from Thailand and Japan into the U.S. And I think, well, how do people develop their own voice within a crowd of people, I mean, uh, who all want to say something? And I look at people that really uh, try to turn their limitations or their uh, conditions into com something completely unique. Someone like Barca, who's uh, an, uh, an architect from Mexico, obviously very inspired by Cabousier, went back to Mexico trying to think, what could I do that is my own and very different than what I've seen in Europe? And he could really uh, develop his own voice, of course, with influence on Western, Western architecture, but something that become very unique and strong towards, uh, and say, the global message. Or someone like Mindy Meyer, who's also from Brazil, Again, obviously, heavily influenced by Cabousier, 
were able to really find its own voice in the curved on the landscape of the saints in Brazil. Look at the way he used concrete and other things, uh, really create a, a unique language for, for himself. And also my master, my mentor, Taro Ando, who for me represent what Japanese culture and architect is about. It's about the beauty that comes from poverty. It's the beauty from not having, rather than having everything, which is the opposite from America. But at the same time, because we don't have everything, it doesn't imagination level that people need to fulfill. And in that sense, I think limitation is actually not what limits you. It's actually what you should start with. And that's what something I've been trying to do in my work and trying to look through to see that. And uh, his thoughts is represented very well in this book that I'm sure that everyone knows. It's a well-known book by a Japanese author uh, written uh, at a time when Japan was going through modernization. And he was talking longingly about Japanese values and cultures that there were laws to the transformation and the eagerness of Japanese people that tried to adopt the Western values. He was talking about the fact that instead of, you know, just celebrate all the light, everything that you could have, why don't we celebrate darkness or shadow? Because there's a lot of us in the dark. It's, there's a lot of us already in, in what we have before. And through that, I would like to talk just a little bit about light and, and lightness, because in the Japanese culture, funny as it is, these two terms are very related. Light and lightness uh, in Japan are represented by very similar words, almost very similar to the English language as well. Light is karui, whereas the uh, uh, illuminated of, of uh, is, is akaru. And in a way that it's almost like a pun. But it's interesting because that's what our Japanese architecture has been doing for all times. Because Japanese architecture from all times up until today is about trying to create light or weightlessness by using light. And it does in many ways. It does through trans trans translucency, transparency. It does it by uh, uplifting details. Because in Japan, light always comes from below. There's no light coming from above. The light always reflects from the landscape going to the room. And the way that people deal with the layout of the rooms and everything is related to the south orientation, because where that's where the light comes from, and all of these. And it deals with the fragmentation or decomposition of planes to make sure that light keep penetrating to create a sense of weightlessness into the concision. And of, of course, there's a sense of time, which is crucial in Japanese architecture. How do you allow time to be felt within architecture, and a lot of that uh, is done using light. For example, you know, the Shoji screen, which is a Japanese uh, uh, design device, as you all know, is a good example of how translucency is being used to create a sense of lightness and illuminate it. It's used in traditional architecture, as well as uh, contemporary architecture. This is a building by Sana uh, in, in Germany. So the sense of using translucent material has been something that Japanese architects embrace and really keep pushing the limits. The second is that light, uh, for those that have been to Japan, I hope that you've seen uh, many of the good examples of the traditional architecture too, that the details of lighting uh, in Japan is always about uplifting. You can see that the roof, the planes, everything always have a gap so that the light from below come and lift the roof up, lift the plane up, and in a way that allowed uh, the clarity of the structure to be felt by using light uh, as part of the composition of the architecture. This is uh, the Church of Light by Taiwanto, and you can see that the same way light is being, being used as a partner to make the meaning of the position felt by the experiencer. And the other thing is using light to break the planes, uh, to create a sense of weightlessness or lightness there, which you see a lot in contemporary Japanese architecture. And the other thing, uh, the last thing, is by creating a sense of impermanence. It's very important in a lot of Western, I mean, sorry, Eastern cultures that the sense of 
uh, impermanent, the, temp the, the sense that everything come and go, is the philosophy that God uh, expressed within the architecture. And this is done many, through many ways. This is one of the projects that uh, I worked on with Andona in New York, which is a restaurant, that we use uh, the bottles and wines and so forth. And then, uh, just very quickly about my work, uh, more and more I work a lot for museums and art, and that's kind of my expertise. At the same time, I do a lot of projects related to the environment, which you can show. Uh, one of the, the, one of the, uh, the slogan or the, the thought that I've used a lot in my work is invisible green. Because in America now, everyone is very aware about the green movement, green architecture, green design, uh, you know, green thinking. Green color, even people call that. I think that it's important to be green, but at the same time, the green is, has to be invisible. The green cannot be added on. It has to be part of the spectrum. And how do you do it in a way? So I coined the term, the term invisible green to make people feel that it has to be integrated in the way you think. And the message of the architecture and the message of the society has to be the same thing. And so this is uh, the first museum that we uh, completed in uh, 2007 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is the, the first green art museum in the world. And we just talk a little bit about how we arrived at the design, uh, the orientation of the building in relationship to geography, climate, and so forth. And all the different you know, green design features that got into the building because we wanted to integrate it. We don't want to People have come to the building and said, oh, that's a green material and that is not. I think in a way we want the whole body to relate to what it should be uh, within our time. This is what the building looked like. It's, um, it's a lot of concrete. Uh, around 80% of, of, of the spaces have natural light. Of course, in the gallery, offices, and so forth. There's a lobby there. Uh, very simple, classic. Uh, it fit uh, with the city quite well. It sit right in the middle of the city. It, it's around a million people in Grand Rapids. And, they're mostly Dutch. So in, in a way that the idea that something clean, clean line and simple is what they, they like to see. We do a material in some of the details of the building there. And then you know how the, the elements, earth, water, uh, light, and air is being used within the building. That the details of how natural light come in because for different spaces. Or well, one of the things which is very difficult for our museum to be green is because our museum consumes a lot of energy. Our museum also wants natural light, but of course we get the heat, the heat gain, the heat loss that come with it. And I, I, I did a mistake uh, when I was interviewed by the New York Times, because I want people to try to understand what it is. I said that our museums are like big refrigerators, because you keep the art at a precise humidity and temperature 24 hours a day, every day. With or without people, that, in, that building is consume energy just like a refrigerator. And when you think about that, how do you do it in a way that is uplifting, that's a message to society that are, uh, you know, we need to, 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 to preserve art, and that's why we spend a lot of money and energy towards it. So it has to be an inspiring message between art and environment. And part of that, and for example, in, in the use of lighting, there's lighting in the, in the skyline, as you see from here, or in the lighting in, all of the public spaces and so forth. And so there are many the devices that we use to try to make sure that we can minimize, optimize the use of energy that come through. For example, in different telecases, we design these louvers that are set up at 25 degrees, so the lines can bounce off from the outside to the inside. So you get the illumination, but not the heat that come with it, and so forth. So all of these, we work uh, quite closely with our uh, lighting designers. In different telecases, we work uh, from on the daylight with our lighting, uh, and on the, uh, the artificial light, I think it was isometrics from London as well. So both of that uh, we uh, do to make sure that we get the right solution on it. And the design of the light in the building, this particular case, because we're relating to the sky, so we do the sky layout, which is related to uh, a commission work by my Ellen, uh, uh, sculpture outside of the museum, so there's an indoor outdoor aspect happening in there too. This is another project which is about the construction. Uh, this is the work we've been doing for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, it is an art bridge, it is a pedestrian bridge that crossing one section of the Los Angeles River. 
and the last Madras River on a good day kind of looked like this because uh, this, the, 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 the city decided a long time ago that it wants to completely concrete the river just for safety. Because of that, people don't have any relationship to the river. They all get for trash in there and all it got become such a big problem. And since around 15 years ago, there's been a big movement to try and revive the river. And this is a river to be designed, which is part of uh, uh, this big mural piece, uh, which is called the Great Wall of Los Angeles, uh, painted around 30 years ago. It tells the story of Los Angeles through the water and all the minorities and people that move into the city. And so this uh, bridge is supposed to help people cross, at the same time serving as a building platform for people to look uh, to cross and be able to look at the river and, and, and mural itself. And so when I was asked to design this, I went to the site with, uh, with my clients. And when I saw that, I felt that the best thing that could happen is we don't have to bring any materials to the site. We should just build this whole bridge out of what we found. And we found a lot of trash. We found a lot of other things. And so how do you make this into part of what the bridge should communicate to the people? So we started researching. This is where the how factor of my office comes into play. We do a lot of research of the trash people throw to the river. We try to uh, make see how we can uh, use it. We work very closely with a lot of manufacturers uh, in Los Angeles and Santa Monica area. That, you know, and there's a big uh, recycle movement there. So we were able to learn from them and be able to use this as part of the, uh, the bridge. And we got our grant, so we will be constructing very soon. Uh, this is a, a very quick house, but I just want to show some of my residential projects as well. This is, this is a big house that we uh, designed about uh, three years ago that was went on hold and now just coming back. It's a house on uh, uh, a major uh, street called Mohan Drive, which is this one right here. And the sign is right here, almost like a promontory, sticking out between the Medellin Canyon and uh, Beverly Glen. They go up on both sides. So in a way, it's, uh, it's a very strong site, but it is very... Uh, disturbed because, because of all the traffic around it. So I tried to create a house that, in a way, almost like a non-house because uh, the size is so strong that I feel like the architecture should not be strong at all because the sign should be strong, the, the form should be formless, the architecture should be formless. And so I tried to kind of look at ways to make the building formless. But at the same time, when the form is you know, formless, I would like the space to be very complex. So we start thinking about the indoor outdoor aspect, which is very known or very uh, I mean, commonly practiced in, in California, is trying to create a sense of space that blur the indoor and outdoor aspect of the space. So it starts from almost like a barcode situation and trying to really kind of blend this into uh, the blurring of the separation of the indoor and outdoor. So instead of a glass room with, a, with, with an eve, we think, well, what can we do out of the indoor and outdoor aspect? So if we start dividing the rooms into its own pavilion, connecting by a big roof, and then you have the indoor outdoor, and the water in and out kind of thing, and on the other side, which is the guest house, is completely underground. So that's what the, the house of life on the model court, you arrive in there, and the guest house is down here, and you go to the house from there, and then that's where everything is, and this is, you know, uh, from the inside of the house, you're looking from the office to the dining room, and the living room beyond, and that's, uh, Or we can completely make a decision 
out of one continuous band of materials. You know, so we started to make a model, make brittle out of film, and then try to kind of uh, develop this into an aspect that, you know, kind of like this, that uh, the space started to be unfold using the materials as uh, the source of inspiration. And inside, you know, the, the, the element and frame that we use and so forth. And it has one of the best ways of looking down I actually made a movie piece uh, as part of the presentation to the client because the, the clients are actually were, were quite conservative, and so uh, and so they actually wanted to finish our house. But I think uh, redesigning the house for a long time, not showing what it looked like, only showing the plans. Uh, at, at one point, my staff he told me, "Well, at some point you're gonna have to know what the house looked like." And it was at a moment that it's, it's kind of a take it or leave it uh, kind of moment. So I decided to do a movie. Uh, because I felt that both of them work in Hollywood, so they, they're so used to seeing movie images, and that's maybe the only way to have a chance to really convince them of having a modern house. So I did a movie uh, based on a Hitchcock movie that, you know, uh, uh, just like a detective uh, going to the house, and as he was trying to look for the crime scene, he, he realized that he's looking at the house, and then at the end of, of the movie, then the whole house uh, fall up into the diagram and he realized that he was in a dream. Uh, I couldn't show them the video today, but if you go to my website, uh, there will be a, a, a video there just to, and we did everything in house for that. And this is our exhibition that's been traveling the world, just came back to California this uh, fall. It's called the Four Such Boxes. Because what we did was that we, we were asked to do uh, an exhibition based on uh, uh, green architecture. And I thought, well, the first thing it has to be done is that it has to be an exhibition that doesn't create trash. Because exhibitions always create trash. And the, the more beautiful it is, the more trash you make. And how do you make it in a way that the trash, you know, you can easily put the exhibition down, it's a wonderful, inspiring moment. At the same time, when it's done, everything just leave with it, there's no trash involved. At the same time, when it's done at the top of the office, we think, well, why don't we make the whole exhibition out of trash as well? So we made these four boxes uh, out of plywood that was reclaimed or recycled from construction site. And we made them into four cabinets of curiosities. And we named them according to materials, earth and water, light and air, time and space, that they all basically opened. And when, when they close, they function as their own traveling crates. You can ship them in their own traveling crates. But when they open, they become cabinets of curiosity that tell, talk to people about different aspects of green architecture within the whole uh, design. Uh, in a way, it's like the old cabinet of curiosities, or in a way, it's like the Swiss Army knife, that it can be very compact, but when they open up, it's very useful. So each of these can talk about different aspects of the architecture. Uh, for example, the earth and water talk about materials, light and air talk about how light and air are being used within the architecture. The time to talk about how we intervene with all buildings and renovation and how you create a vision when time is part of the, the, the experience. And space, of course, is a kind of basic element of architecture. And uh, the show has been traveling the world for uh, four years now. And it's coming back, uh, just opened at a uh, university that we just got a project. So we uh, send the show over there. And this is uh, just some quick project that we're working on. This is. Uh, 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 the Speed Art Museum in Kentucky that we started working on around a year ago. But uh, it's an old building and expansion, but what, what I would like to talk about is actually the strategy that I use. Because I start thinking, well, how do museums grow? Because museums by nature have to grow, because you have to keep collecting and so forth. And you can grow like, like a frog, just keep uh, inflating yourself until you completely explode. Or you can grow like a Frankenstein. You can grow by saying, okay, well, I want an architect to do my arm, another architect to do my leg, I want another head from another architect. So in the end, it becomes a composition that really becomes like, like Frankenstein. So I came up with the idea of acupuncture architecture, that it's a, it's a transformation from, in, from inside rather than from outside. Just like, you know, acupuncture in the sense that you're solving the problem by not cutting. You're solving the problem by actually precisely 
intervene at the point uh, where you need to do. Rather than trying to kind of cut everything out and see what's going on, you try to understand where the, where's the life in this building and how do I enhance that life using the flow and the understanding of the system. And so that's, that's kind of how we work. I don't want to go into detail, but this is some of the strategies we use at the Speed Museum. And that, and that's building, we start analyzing the internal uh, fragmentation of the functions and how we're going to make a change from within, the connection from indoor outdoor that the museum needs to have, and from within as well, that's some of the uh, expansion that we are doing. We, we in design development right now, so we should make programming in a year ago, in, in, in a year later. So that just how the new uh, uh, places are related to the old and things like that. There's uh, another project which is um, uh, about to, to, to start construction next year, which is a museum uh, in Texas that we have done. This is a site. The site is around 14 acres of land with a creek running in the middle of it. And it always feels like the running of the, uh, the falling water by Frank Wright Ryan to me when I look at the site because it has this wonderful creek running. And it started with the idea that the client really liked to have a landmark, that it, it is some, it's a very small city. So they, this museum has to be everything. It has to be the art museum, it has to be the event hall, it has to be the restaurant, it has to be everything combined within one building. At the same time, you know, uh, when they start saying that they want this to be a landmark, I start thinking, well, how do, how do you exactly mark the land? And by looking at some of the examples of Indian, uh, you know, uh, people uh, that used to live in Texas, this is how they mark the land. And so I started to look at how the building can be something that you mark on the land, something that has very, very small footprint, leaving as many trees as possible around, uh, creating a wonderful landscape for parking that feel like it's part of the museum experience when you're outdoor, and leading up to something that's almost like a tree house, that a very small footprint, and people can really enjoy uh, the site from all angles. And that's what the building looked like, uh, sitting right into the creek, which is one over here, and they all, it's not very simple, it's start from boxes that turning 60 degrees every time. So when you come up from the ground floor to the top, you actually see seeing 360 degrees on the side. So as a way to understand where you are and how you relate to nature around you. So this is what it is, the arm section. And the plan, I just need to show the plan because you can't imagine how complex it is to, to design a building this small. Uh, with all of the rotation that we have done, but we, we've done a good job at making sure that no, there's no waste spaces within and everything related to, for example, all of the floor will point towards a different angle on the site and allow people to engage with, with that. So that's the roof plan, that's from the creek looking up, uh, from the entrance over there. And then from the skin, we don't have a lot of money, so we're looking at uh, basically a uh, metal panel that is coated very high gloss, almost like a car, and do it in a way that's durable and allow the building to reflect. I don't want it to be a mirror, but I, because I, this, you, you cannot just reflect. I mean, I think mean you need to uh, relate to the science somehow. So we come up with some uh, facade idea that allow the reflection and the non-reflection to work together. So that's kind of one of the targets we have. Inside the building, it has an atrium that go out to the top, uh, maybe similar to the Guggenheim in the way that it's around. It's about moving around one central space uh, with big keys in, uh, uh, in the middle, and that's what they look like. Okay, thank you very much for your time. And this is my office, and um, uh, uh, 